70 family members came to Egypt as a result of the famine in the land. They came there to survive. Now these 70 are in the hands of Joseph. And they were keepers of livestock. And they lived in Egypt and they were given their own section of land. The land of the land of Joshua. Joshua. Goshen. Goshen. Where they could raise their stock. Well, they began to multiply. Exodus 1 7. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. God reached down and blessed Jacob and Joseph, and the multitude began. But their status began to fall apart during the time when they left their homeland. Then, I think in verse 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 7, a king rose up that did not know Joseph. And he saw that these people were getting bigger than the Egyptian was. <coughs> and he became jealous. And he was afraid that these people whom God had blessed was a threat to him because in those days they, they, they moved from place to place. And if there was one nation here, a group of people here, if another group moved in over here, if that group got bigger than this group over here, they could overtake this group. So before they got really, really big, the Pharaoh says, I'm going to bring you into captivity. So he made them slaves. And he put them in forced labor camps in his massive building projects, as we know. And all this did was to make the children of Israel stronger and strong-willed. What the Egyptians found out, the more you afflicted them, the greater they got and the stronger they got and the more strong-willed they got. And they kept multiplying. Because their plot failed, their cruelty then was unveiling. They had, asked, they had, they had uh, caused their enemies to get worse on them. And they tried to divide them. The Egyptians tried to divide them, and they tried to appoint them uh, to do more things, to do more mental work in the land, that they might be crushed down and their spirit become base, give them the little small things to do so that they're, you know, talking about having a, uh, what is that called, a poor image? A self, yeah, a PR complex, a self poor image. They didn't have counselors in those days. But they thought if they could make them be little of nothing, that they would just give up and die. But God met and overruled this policy in various ways as he went through. And the severe treatment that they had to bear from their enemies became their discipline. See, what we do is we try to make it easy on our people. <laughs> yeah. if, they, if they have one bad day, we just boo hoo them to death, you know? Sometimes they should have a rough day. Maybe they should spend a day in uh, solitude. <clears throat> you know, we, we, we make it so easy that they think they should have everything they want. Yeah. When they holler, we jump. The Egyptians didn't jump. But, they're, but, but they, they're disciplined. In order to cut loose the bonds that bond them to Egypt, the sharp knife of affliction must be used. And now you can get a cast living in Egypt. You can enjoy living in Egypt. 
Because some of them had it pretty easy. They stayed 400 years. But if they had if they had yielded to the Egyptian way of life, they all would have become Egyptians and there would have been no problem. We'll join you. We'll be just like you. We'll talk like you and we'll dress like you and we'll, we'll go to places like you do. We want to be one of you. The idea of God in affliction was to wean them off from the Egyptian world. Well, after 400 years, God said it's time for you to leave Egypt and go back to the land that I have promised to give you. Oh, darn. We've had it so easy in Egypt. We want to stay. Moses could have had a fight on his hands. And I would say perhaps there were some did not put blood on the doorpost because they didn't want to leave Egypt. There were some who did not believe the report of Moses. I'm sure not every person in Egypt wanted to leave. And I'm sure some left and when they got out in the wilderness they said, please send us back to Egypt. And God, O Pharaoh, said, I'm not going to let him go. And God had to move in and the contest with Pharaoh began. The ten plagues, you remember. The ten judgments of God upon Egypt. Let my people go. Pharaoh said, not by the chinny chin chin. My chin, I'm not going to let you go. <laughs> well, Pharaoh would not. God brought finally to the tenth judgment. And this would cause Pharaoh to let the people go. All the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth on his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the meal, and all the firstborn of all the beasts. 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 5. The death of the firstborn happened in Egypt that night. The judgment would create the exodus. But not with the 70 who came. But millions would leave. They started with 70, they left with millions. And God sent his executioner, the death angel. And he would go through Egypt and kill every firstborn in every house, in every firstborn cat, cow, firstborn horse, firstborn dog. But from the Hebrew, to be spared, the work of his angels, God instructed the angels not to take the life of the home that the blood was over the doorpost. A lamb of the first year, spotless, take it into their home, make it their own for a period of time, four days, and then kill it and offer it as a sacrifice unto the Lord. Put the blood on the doorpost, on the upper doorpost of the house. Specifically, God said, do this specifically. Remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, What can I do to receive eternal life? Jesus, knowing the heart of this man, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sell everything you've got. Guess what? He wouldn't do it. I do wonder if someone comes forward and wants to be saved and he says, what can I do to have eternal life? And you have this sense and you say, the first thing, sir, that I want you to do before you're saved is I want you to do A, B, and C, and D. And when you do, are you willing to do those things? Are you willing to make Jesus your Lord? 
Are you willing to come to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night? <laughs> Are you willing to take Pastor Charles's notes and put them in a notebook and keep them for a whole year? <laughs> Well, in that case, I don't know if I want to be saved. I wonder how many people would accept the salvation that required us to make Him the Lord of our lives. Specifically, God said you have to take the lamb for four days, kill it, eat it, take the blood, and put it on the doorpost. And then you eat it, the flesh that night, roast it with fire, and unleavened bread with bitter earth. Chapter 12, verse 8, right? <coughs> and when the death angel came by and seen the blood, he would pass by. Here's the point. Here's the point. The lamb's life would be the price, the purpose price for the firstborn. The lamb would be the place of the firstborn. The lamb that you slain and killed is going to take the place of your firstborn. The lamb was the substitute. This is where we get the substitutionary death. The lamb became the substitutionary death for the firstborn to be spared. A lamb for a child. The lamb would pay the price that God required, thus saving the firstborn. Wouldn't those be busy days in preparation? Every family searching for a lamb that was spotless. And you and God know and knew where a spotless lamb was. And since the firstborn was precious to them, they would be filled with anxiety as they searched for a lamb that would be accepted with God. God requires our best. He requires our first fruit. God requires our first life. I said on Facebook this day, it's not, it's not how many years you've lived, Yep. It's how well you've lived your years. Well, I've lived to be 92 years old, or 98 years old, or 105 years old. It doesn't matter how long you live, it matters how well you've lived those years. Some people live better in 50 years, and some people live in 75 years. I would have to, I would have to put blood all over that door. And not just a little, but a lot, so that the executioner of God would be sure to see the blood. Is there enough evidence in your life? Is there enough evidence in your life that when the death angel comes, he'll know which way to take? Been watching too much of it. Highway to heaven. No, not highway to heaven. I wish you had touched by an angel. <laughs> Is there going to be enough evidence? This blood filled home to be sure to secure the safety of the firstborn. They took a bunch of hyssop and applied the blood, and that hyssop speaks of humility of the soul concrete and repentance. In other words, they just didn't dash it on the door. They just didn't dash it everywhere saying, doggone it, i got to do this, doggone it, i got to... They had to use it in humility. There had to be repentance. There had to be contrition. The blood then became that which was shed for the people. <coughs> Evening came, the families would wait, they were at the table with their sandals on, their staffs were in their hands, 
Their clothes were girded up, and their shoes on their feet, they were ready to move. Their long robes were to be girded up so that they might not be hindered in the way of the march. Shoes on, ready to journey through the wilderness. They were to eat in haste because they expected at any moment the Lord might come and pass over them. Any moment they might be called to arise and go to the land of bondage. 